everyone. Psychosocial Wednesdays. This is an initiative created by Paul Antonello, that's me, Stefano Capani, and Bernhard von Goretzky. More than a century ago, Freud gathered colleagues for Wednesday meetings that opened the world of psychoanalysis to a wide range of powerful ideas. Psychosocial Wednesdays are modeled on those Wednesdays and on Jung's meetings at the Psychological Club in Zurich and feature speakers from different psychoanalytic traditions, schools, and associated fields. So this is the second of our events. Last uh, two weeks ago, we saw Susan Rowland, who did a fantastic opening for us. Um, these seminars are recorded and all the participants are muted, um, except for Tom and I, of course. And if you have a question, when there are questions after Tom's presentation, please put it in the chat box and Bernhard will pick it up and send it to us. Um, I see Peter is asking again, unmute. No, we're not going to unmute anyone else because there are going to be a hundred people in the room. So there's no way of doing it. Um, if you have any technical problems, please message Bernhard or Stefano, and hopefully they'll be able to help you. And the, one of the only problems is we are still limited to 100 participants. Apologies. We promised to try to fix that. Um, it's more complicated than we thought. But the session appears later as a video on YouTube, so you'll be able to see it there. Um, our first session with Susan has already appeared there. You can also check our Facebook page for updates. Our next guest is going to be in two weeks. It will be Polly Young Eisendrath, and strangely enough, it will be on a Monday. I know that will confuse everyone, but we'll announce it repeatedly. Um, as for me, those of you who don't know me, my hair never looks like this. This is a lockdown haircut by someone with a really poor sense function. So, you know, I did what I could. But fortunately, you're actually not here to see me. You're here to see Tom Singer, um, who's going to speak on cultural complexes in the soul of America. So, Tom, would you like to give your presentation? Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very nice to be part of a two-week-old tradition that uh, has its roots in a hundred-year-old tradition that's very Jungian. Um, and uh, it really is an honor to be able to speak to this group because you, I can't see an audience or I just see a few faces. It's a bit of a, a crapshoot in terms of trying to get a feel for the audience, and, and which I usually like to do, and I usually like to throw things open, but obviously it's very hard to do in this context. But I'm especially excited to introduce our, our new book, which will be published on June 4th. And I say our because it is truly a group effort. It's called Cultural Complexes in the Soul of America. And there are 17 of us that contributed to it. Uh, I, I thought I, I prepared some remarks, of course, because uh, it's hard to, to fly blind, although although most of our leaders these days seem to fly blind. Um, I have three sort of areas that I'd like to cover, and, and I hope I'm not repetitive for some of you who have either heard me before or are more familiar with these ideas than others, but I, I felt it impor <clears throat> important to give a background. So I want to provide a bit of a theoretical background to the development of the book. Second, I want to give an overview of the structure and contents of the book itself, and finally, I thought I would uh, uh, focus on, on one chapter, it's actually the preface, um, to give a kind of detailed example of the kind of thinking that goes on in this sort of rather freewheeling and sometimes amorphous concept of, of the cultural complex. I, 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 I like specificity, actually, and so, um, I structure things in my mind, but then I find when I get into a project, I sort of let the structure go and, and people do what they want with the concept if they want to do anything at all with the concepts. So I'm not too 
I don't think I'm too rigid or dogmatic about the concept, although I still think it's quite, I think it's very valid and useful. So first I wanna give a little background on the theory that gave rise to this book, which I see as being firmly rooted in the, in the tradition of analytical psychology. This, this project of cultural complexes grows out of analytical psychology and particularly Jung's theory of complexes, which actually is what initially brought Jung and Freud together. Uh, Freud did some original work on complex theory and, and psychosis, and uh, Jung did, and, and Freud got very interested in their first meeting was really prompted by that original research of, of Jung's on complexes. Uh, for pretty much the first hundred years of our tradition, and I will generalize, and you can say I'm wrong, and there are examples to prove I'm wrong, but our tradition was pretty much focused on the analysis and the psychology of the individual, and that was particularly in the context of Jung's developing theory of archetypal psychology. And so what happened in that process of focusing on the individual with the background of archetypal psychology, I think it's fair to say that the social and cultural level of the psyche was often either left out or a shadowy backdrop out of which the individual hopefully would emerge in some sort of process called individuation. So frequently the so-called collective was seen as something out of which the individual would individuate. And, and there wasn't a lot of emphasis uh, uh, on what that social cultural context might be. Not that Jung wasn't uh, tremendously interested in different cultures. And, and, and in many ways, what we're talking about today, I think originates in, in Jung's ideas, including his ideas about culture. But the primary axis for the first hundred years really was the individual and the archetype. And the social and the cultural was secondary at best. <clears throat> in the 1960s, in the San Francisco tradition, which was really firmly rooted in, in complex theory, Joe Henderson postulated a, a middle realm of the unconscious that sits between the personal and collective unconscious. He imagined a, a zone where what went on at the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious where the archetypes theoretically live. There was a whole realm, what he called the cultural unconscious, which is where all of the psychosocial aspects of who we are and where we come from really reside both consciously and, and unconsciously. And it's really only been for the last 20 years or so with people like Andrew Samuels and, and Jerome Bernstein and, and, and several others that we began to open up this realm of what we might call the, the cultural unconscious or the social cultural aspects of, of human relationships. And then in around 2000, Sam Kimballs and I began to discuss the notion of cultural complexes as being the fundamental building blocks of what Henderson called the cultural unconscious. And over the past uh, 20 years, I've explored cultural complexes with some 90 different authors contributing to books on Europe, Australia, Latin America, and two soon to be released books, uh, one on Far East Asian cultural complexes and the other on the book we're discussing today, Cultural Complexes in the Soul of America. I found in Fanny Brewster's chapter in this upcoming book, the following quote from Jung, which I don't recall having seen before, but I like it very much. <clears throat> Jung wrote the, the via regia, I guess the royal, the road to the unconscious, however, is not the dream. The royal road to the unconscious is not the dream as Freud thought, but the complex, which is the architect of dreams and of symptoms. Nor is this via so very royal either since the way pointed out by the complex is more like a rough and uncommonly devious footpath that often loses itself in the undergrowth and generally leads not into the heart of the unconscious, but past it. It's a very interesting comment uh, from Jung about the relationship between dreams and complexes. I, I think what Jung said about personal complexes, because mostly he was focused on personal complexes, although I think quite implicit in his work was the notion of cultural uh, complexes, but he never really developed that. I think of cultural complexes being an inner sociology that mediates our experience of the world 
and provides us with ready-made unconscious meanings and attitudes to all sorts of group experiences in the world. And I've sometimes likened cultural complexes there being a psychic kidney that serves as a filter of the external and internal psychic sea in which we swim. And I don't use sea sort of loosely as a metaphor. I really do think we swim in a psychic sea with contents that we don't see but are going inside and out of us live inside of us, live outside, mutually interpenetrating. And I envision cultural complexes as kind of a filtration system that we both inherit uh, uh, from our, our personal family and cultural surroundings, and then also build upon through our personal experiences. So if we think of uh, cultural complexes, uh, as essential components of the filtering system in our individual and group psyches, they function in the following way. And, and this is where I get specific because I really like a concept to have characteristics so that if you think, is this a cultural complex, you can sort of say, well, there's some criteria at least that the theory has spelled out and let me see if what I think is a cultural complex has these specific characteristics or qualities, because otherwise we start to use the concept in such a loose way that like archetypes or complexes or any other, any other phrase we lose, it begins to lose its meaning because we just sort of, we just get sloppy about our use of it. And I, I like to apply things in a, in a fairly specific way, although these are essentially loose categories. So cultural complexes are autonomous. They have a life of their own in the psyche that is separate from the everyday ego of an individual or a group. Sometimes they are dormant, and sometimes, as when activated by trigger words, they come alive in the psyche and take hold of one's thoughts, feelings, memories, images, and behavior. And it's useful to think in when you're thinking of complexes. What's the memory of the complex? What's the thought of the complex? What's the image of the complex? What's the behavior, the emotion that's, that's triggered by the complex? <clears throat> Cultural complexes are repetitive. Uh, they, they continue ongoing in groups in an uninterrupted way, sometimes for generations and even millennia. When they are activated, they are surprisingly unchanged in the sense that they are recurring, repetitive, and expressive of the same emotional and ideological content over and over again. They collect experiences and memories that validate their own point of view. I mean, right now, uh, at least in the United States, and I suspect elsewhere in Western Europe and around the world, uh, people's complexes, are, certainly in the United States, if you're if you're a Trump fan, everything you hear gets filtered through your Trumpian cultural complex and you build on those memories and ideas and they're repetitive and they're the same over and over again. <clears throat> uh, once a cultural complex has established itself, it has a remarkable capacity, like a virus replicating, not only to repeat itself, but also to make sure that whatever happens in the world fits into its pre-existing point of view. And cultural complexes are extremely resistant to facts. Everything that happens in the world is understood through their point of view. They collect experiences and self-affirming memories. The thoughts of cultural complexes tend to be simplistic and black and white. Although they form the core cognitive content of a cultural complex, the thoughts themselves are not complex. They are rigid, impervious to modification, and they they seem to be impervious to any outside influence. They have strong affects or emotions by which one can recognize their presence. Uh, it, uh, knee jerk reactivity, emotional reactivity, I think of as the calling card of a cultural complex. And finally, and this is Sam Kimball's was very good on insisting on this not all cultural complexes are destructive, not all cultural, cultural complexes are ego dystonic. Uh, to the cultural identity of a group or individual. That's a very important point. So that's, that's just a, a bit of theoretical orientation to the idea of cultural complexes. It's, it's, I've sort of simplified it and distilled it, but I wanted to at least 
in talking about this book to give you something of the theoretical background that's informed it. This book, the second part, contents and structure of this book, originated in an article I wrote in 2008 for Spring Magazine that I wrote on the eve of the presidential election in which Barack Obama became the first black president of the United, United States. And I called this essay, uh, A Personal Meditation on Politics and the Soul of America. And it was precipitated by a journey that I took with my wife and my children back to the Midwest, uh, where both of us had grown up and, and my wife had grown up in Alton, Illinois, which was one of the original aboriginal, uh, original uh, railroads uh, um, um, for the, um, um, not aboriginal, I'm, I, I, I'm losing my thought here. Anyway, um, where the slaves traveled from the south to the north. And um, uh, Alton was sort of a stopping point on this railroad and had a very famous newspaper uh, run by a man named Lovejoy, which was really uh, 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 very, very important. It's where the Lincoln-Douglas debates were held. Anyway, we traveled to Alton to bury her mother on a July 4th weekend. She had died in in the Bay Area. And I found myself in journeying back to the Midwest where I grew up feeling something about the soul of America. And I started reading Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And Whitman really is the, I think, the poet of the, Amer of the soul of America. And um, I started thinking about the relationship between cultural complexes and the soul of America. Now, some of you may say, well, what the hell is the soul of America? Or there got to be lots of different souls of America. And of course there are. There are many different souls. But, but we can, at least, we can refer to something of the soul of America, which takes different forms at different, in different eras and is incarnated by different people. Martin Luther King would be one. Barack Obama would be another. John F. Kennedy, they come to, they come to stand symbolically for... Oh, uh, something of the best in America, just as, as Trump may stand for something that's the worst in America. But the idea that I started to play with is that maybe the soul of America is forged in what we do with our cultural complexes. We tend to think of politics as sort of sui generis being something, a force unto itself, but politics really is where in my mind, it's really fueled by our cultural complexes. And it's in the, what we do with these complexes that determines sort of, I think, the fate of our soul, who we are, what we are as a people. Right now, we're in a, a terrible negredo or whatever you want to call it, where the soul of America seems shallow and rotten to the core and uh, and uh, in in a in a terrible place of of dismemberment and disintegration, and part of that I think is is due to the fact that we're in the grips of very long-standing cultural complexes, all of which are kind of surfacing at the same time with tremendous memory and emotion and simplistic thought and behavior. It's 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 as if everything has gotten stirred up in the in the cultural unconscious, maybe even the collective unconscious. And, and so the, these cultural complexes have been activated. And it's not an accident that our Democratic, uh, uh, nom well, presumed nominee, uh, uh, Joe Biden, is actually talking about renewing the soul of America. Uh, 50 years ago or 20 years ago, you really couldn't talk in public about soul. That wasn't very scientific. But I think we're getting more comfortable with a public discourse about the nature of soul. So the core of this book, the core idea is that it's really what Jung said about complexes. The, it's not that we have complexes. He said that's a banal fact. That's just a fact of existence. We all have our complexes. What makes a difference is what we do with them. And I would argue that the same thing that applies to the individual also applies to those collective or cultural complexes. It's not that we have them. It's what we do with them that makes a difference. And that's why political process is so interesting to me. In, in pulling this book together, um, this was a very difficult book to pull together. Almost, uh, almost every author 
was sort of wrestled to the ground by the cultural complex they were dealing with. And I got several, I, I had a lot of authors who said they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it in time. They didn't want to do it. They were immobilized by it. And I really had to keep cajoling them to, to believing that what they were writing about was important and significant. But it took a long time for these essays to come together. And then when I got them all together, there were 16 of them. I really didn't know what to do with them. It was, it was a massive confuser. It, was, it, it had everything, including the kitchen sink in it. And just like living in America today or Europe today, it was all sort of an indecipherable mess and chaotic. And it was really hard to know how to, to organize it and pull any meaning out of it. I, I consulted with a good friend of mine, uh, an analyst, Jungian analyst in the Bay Area, Aiden Goodman, and we spent a lot of time talking about this. And eventually, uh, a table of contents emerged. And I'm hoping that um, uh, 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 that uh, Paul, we can put up that table of contents for people to see, because there, there's no way I can mention or even properly honor 16 different authors. But at least what I can do is show you the table of contents and the way in which we've structured the book. And the structure that emerged was sort of what I called, uh, uh, I, what did I call it? Meta something or other. So an, an, an overview, uh, there you go. Um, meta themes in, America cultural, in American cultural complexes. And, uh, and these were more generalized theme with the second section being focused more on specific cultural complexes. And um, you can see that we, we have a, a, a number of these contributors may be known to you and some of them may not be known to you, uh, but it's a really distinguished group of authors. <clears throat> and um, I simply want to sort of show, the, show you that sort of the structure of this. Uh, one of the important parts of the book in my mind was getting a group of non-Americans, non sort of contemporary de Tocquevilles, to comment on what America looked like from outside and what our cultural complexes look from, like from outside. Um, anyway, I, I can't go into each of these chapters, but I wanted to show it to you. And then the second thing I want to do, the second part of the, of the structure of the book are specific cultural complexes. Um, can you put that up, Paul? Uh, and in this section, and, and as I say, this structure was not evident when these books started coming in. But the second section is called Specific Cultural Complexes. And they're divided into race, gender, immigration, national character, environment, and health care. If you look at these topics, race, gender, immigration, national character, environment, healthcare. If you're an American citizen or you follow American politics, there's nothing new about any one of these themes. There's not a single thing that's new because these have been the ongoing themes, the ongoing core of the cultural complexes that the United States has been dealing with for uh, 300 years, the racial complex is as old as we are as a country, issues of gender identity and uh, the relationship between male and female is as old as we are as a country. Immigration has been a constant theme in, 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 in our country. National character, which, which turned into a dirty word with, with Jung's particular use of it, but I still think is actually a kind of valuable concept, uh, is something that has, uh, undergone many changes uh, through time and our current national what we'd call our national character has take to, taken i think a, a turn for the worse both nationally and internationally the environment is 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 much more of a new issue than an old issue because we just always assume that we had unlimited resource and unlimited space so the cultural complex of our relationship to the environment has changed enormously in the last 20, 30, 50 years. And finally, healthcare. I, I can remember writing in the 80s about healthcare debates and 
and what we're debating in the United States right now in terms of health care is no different than what we were debating when Clinton was running for president in 1990 or whatever it was. In fact, he, he won on a health care agenda of, uh, of uh, undoing our, ins our insurance. And he, and, he, and he actually was successful in getting 95% of what he wanted through. And he and his wife insisted that they wanted 100%. And the whole reform that they pr proposed collapsed. Healthcare as delivery of healthcare as a cultural complex in the United States is, is there's nothing new about it. So these are all recurring themes around which people have strong memories, they have strong feelings, they have very simplistic ideas, and they're all of which are very divisive or right now are profoundly divisive. So that's the structure of the book. And where are we in time? If you could help me, Paul, I just want to really stay, uh, have a few more minutes. Sure, you can, I think it's up to you. Um, yeah. Well, I want to- 20, 25 minute mark, but. Okay, well, I, I just want to, I want to focus on one thing. I want you to show the cover image of the, of the book, uh, Paul, if you can bring that up, because I, I am particularly thrilled about this cover image about which um, Jules Cashford has written the most brilliant, we call it a preface, it's really a chapter in itself. This is an image taken from the film, The Planet of the Apes, which was made in the 60s. And the, the man bending on his knees there is Charlton Heston, who thought he was taking a space odyssey into the year 3900 and something but discovers that actually he's been on earth the whole time when he discovers at the end of the film that the Statue of Liberty is half buried in the sand and is, is sort of um, been, uh, it's obviously no longer a symbol for what it was uh, uh, when it was first uh, uh, brought to the United States in the eight, late 1800s. <clears throat> What's really interesting about this image and the reason I chose it, and I think Jerome Bernstein is the one who originally suggested it, <clears throat> was that it, it suggests that our country uh, far earlier than the planet of the apes predicted, our democracy is in, in grave peril. And it's really ironic that the star of this film was Charlton Heston, who became the leader of the National Rifle Association uh, after he starred in this film. And so you have here the symbol of liberty and uh, freedom that's in a state of deterioration or decline or simply dead, at which this hero Charlton Heston has discovered this fact. And in fact, he later became the leader of one of the most potent and destructive cultural complexes we have in the United States today, which is around the issue of gun control. And uh, uh, um, so let me, just, let me just read a couple of things that Jules wrote about this. The blue skies of the film's desolate ending have turned to blood red glowering over the horizon, so intense and all enveloping, they feel doom laden or even doom eager as the old Icelandic sagas have it. This is much more than a sunset. The violence of the encroaching dark reflects and magnifies the devastation of the statue implicating everything. Only the horse standing closest to the sea and framed by the white spray of waves upon the shore casts his own shadow behind him. In a book about the soul of America, we may wonder whether the living soul of the original image, the original symbolic image of freedom and liberty has moved on, still with the power to startle us, but in a new way. Is it now pressing us to consider whether cultural complexes are the latest version of a loss of liberty and enslavement of the mind? And, and Jules does a magnificent job of talking about how a founding mythology, when it's converted into history or biography or translated into history of biography, can, can, it, it's as if history and biography can sap the energy from the mythology and literalize it 
and concretize it in the way that the NRA has taken the Second Amendment, which says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. For 200 years, this was interpreted as a well-regulated militia. Only in 2008 did the Supreme Court say, no, it's not a well-regulated militia that has the right to bear arms. It's the right of every individual to bear arms. The point here is that a contemporary cultural complex has taken and usurped an archetypal core of liberty and freedom and misappropriated, misappropriated and turned it into something very destructive when it was originally intended to protect and defend freedom and it has now become a way of destroying, uselessly destroying wantonly uh, innocent lives. There are 350 million guns in the United States. There are 330 million people. So the cultural complex of the right to bear arms has so transformed us as a society. It's one of the many cultural complexes that so um, uh, de, what do I want to say? Uh, so, so deteriorated that when we look through that lens, our notions of freedom and liberty get profoundly distorted into something as ridiculous as the right of everybody to carry an assault rifle. So, um, what do I want to say? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just stop here. I've just tried to give you a, a taste of uh, what we're doing in this book. And um, it's just a taste. But maybe you can ask some questions that will help me tease this out a little bit more. If you'll let me, thank you very much. Yeah. We would normally, in a conference, have a round of applause, but that's not the way we've <laughs> organized it. Um, um, I've been really digging around with cultural complexes a lot myself the last couple of years, as you know. And, and I actually have a background of teaching the Frankfurt School, which, in a way, they're doing something parallel. But they're trying to do it with, more with reason rather than the way we would work with a complex, right? So one of the things that always bothers me is danger, death, and the symbolic and the real. When we have a, when we have a cultural complex, everything gets played out in populations. And of course, that can just be sort of despairing, but what can we do to get through a cultural complex without disaster? Or is there any answer to that? Well, um, this reminds me of Jerome Bernstein's work and actually the chapter that he contributed to this book on the, um, what he calls the domi dominion, dominion thinking or the dominion complex and reciprocity, dominion versus reciprocity. <clears throat> and um, Jerome asserts, and I agree with him that, uh, that we've been operating under the dominion paradigm for a long, long time in which basically the human being is placed in the role of uh, having dominion over all of creation. And um, that's our, our natural role and fate according to uh, sort of dominion psychology. And actually Jerome does a really interesting thing with regard to your question, if I can, if I can pull it up here quickly, because I, I really, I really like what he did here. And I will, I actually outlined all of these chapters because I had no idea what I was going to be asked about. And uh, I'm actually, this, this is, see if this answers you in some right. way. I know, would, if there is an answer, of course. Yeah, which yes, is. that's right. If there is an answer, but it's about to, if a complex is going to get way, give way. Does it need to go through some period of disintegration 
and destruction and negredo, particularly if you're operating from an you believe that these complexes are generated in the unconscious and transformation is going to happen somewhere between unconscious and conscious. Mm -hmm. So here's how, here's how Jerome formulates this. President Trump is an agent of the collective unconscious. He himself is unaware of this role in this regard, but his job description in that role has, begin, has been to hasten the collapse of the no longer viable 20th century psychic paradigm of American primacy and dominance as the leader of the Western world economically, scientifically, technically, politically, and militarily. Second, to thrust the nose of the American collective firmly up its shadow and finally, to force a confrontation between our species and nature to see if we can learn to live together in a life-sustaining reciprocal balance, and if not, who will be the survivor? So he's, he's done a really interesting thing. He's, he's basically saying Trump may be doing what Trump thinks he's doing, but actually he's an agent of the collective unconscious, and his role is to bring about the demise and the disintegration of an old paradigm, an old set of cultural complexes that need to be destroyed, and that he's the agent of that destruction by flushing them out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in such a way that we can't avoid them. Yes. It's a very interesting notion, I think. And I think it makes sense. I'm just, as you can see, some of my anxiety is, how will that look in reality? right? This is that problem of symbolic and real, and yeah. the patient, we would encourage them not to start cutting, or to hit their wives, or yeah. to, you know, scream at their bosses, and we'd encourage them to do it symbolically. Yes. How can that be done in a culture? I don't know. You know, the only, or the most positive example that I can point to in recent history about a cultural complex undergoing remarkable transformation in a relatively nonviolent, relatively non-destructive way is the transformation of attitudes to gay marriage and homophobia. If 50 or 60 years ago, you would have predicted where would we would be in relation to a 3,000 year history, which you could call a cultural complex, of homophobia that it would undergo such relatively rapid transformation is quite remarkable. Now, the, the area in which probably we need to be most concerned right now is the environment, because if we don't have a transformation in our relationship to the natural world and our sense of having dominion over all of it, the consequences are catastrophic. Mm -hmm. They're catastrophic. Mm -hmm. How can you predict the outcome of a cultural complex, where it's gonna go? Mm. <laughs> I suppose I simply want to, I can't say that I could. Um, here's a question from Peter Petzl. As you know, I'm an American living in the UK, so this makes sense to me. Given the political and cultural chaos we're experiencing in the UK, is it true to say we can bring your analytical approach to complexes in this country? This country well, being the UK. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would not know how to address that specifically because I don't swim in the cultural complexes of Great Britain. But what I, what I can say to Peter is that the, the work I've been doing over the last 20 years has, uh, has been enlisting what in medical anthropology are called key informants. And key informants are, are, are it's a technical term, I guess, that uh, uh, refers to those people who are experienced in a culture based on either their specific expertise or they're having li lived there for a long time and thought for a long time. And um, I do think the theory of cultural complexes is applicable worldwide, because mm -hmm. I think cultural complexes exist wherever human groups exist. And so I don't think Great Britain is that exceptional to not have cultural complexes and for the theory not to be relevant. When I first started presenting this material, I remember there was a San conference in San Francisco 
And a, a lovely woman came up to me after my presentation. She said, a group of us, we're all students in Zurich, and, and we, we thought your, your idea of cultural complexes is very interesting, but as we were talking among ourselves, we thought, we don't really have any cultural complexes in Switzerland. Uh, uh. And I thought to myself, I thought to myself, either I've done a terrible job of presenting my material, or she's an idiot, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> or Pardon both. me. Pardon or me. Both, maybe. <laughs> yes, I, I'm afraid I do find that funny. Also, <laughs> I'll say, excuse me. I I think that's I I believe that cultural complexes are structural potentials in the psyche wherever there are human groups. This is. Um, I hope I'm not. Uh, cheating to go for a positive question. Um, uh, Ada Gonzalez said, can you talk about the positive cultural complex? Give an example of one. What complexes support the future of America? Well, That's a, that's a really good question, and I, I, I hesitate to give a quick answer because I find myself so burdened by thinking about the negative aspects of cultural complexes that um, I don't spend enough time thinking about the positive aspects of cultural complexes. But I can remember when I gave you the characteristics of cultural complexes, and I added the fifth or sixth which is not all cultural complexes are negative. And I, I mentioned that Sam Kimball's had, had really affirmed that um, uh, and, and felt it was important. And I've come to agree with him. And at the time he was beginning to speak out about the black American experience in a very positive way. And uh, that it, it, it had become a, a very negative, the, racism was so negative in our long history of the United States that it was hard to think of black people or for black people to think of themselves, at least as, as, as at least was common in, in, I don't want to step on a cultural complex here, which mm -hmm. is very easy to do. But I think there's been a whole transformation around a positive sense of uh, black American identity that, uh, represents kind of a freeing up from a terribly negative cultural complex which determined black history in the United States for 300 years. Perhaps the new museum in, in Washington DC, which is a monument uh, to black American history, would symbolize our, our, uh, our emerging ability to take a new look at racism. Uh, Barack Obama's election to the presidency of the United States would certainly suggest that enough Americans were willing to consider a black man or perhaps woman to be president of the United States. That was unthinkable 50 years ago or 100 years ago. So there has been a transformation in a negative cultural complex to something much more positive in terms of identity. By the way, I was thinking, you'll pardon me, you know, I work with musicians, and I did mention on Facebook the other day, I'd been listening to some Copeland. Aaron Copeland, of course, the kind of music that we associate with a very warm, very sort of backward looking and honest America and earlier America, and how that shows up in other, other film scores. And it was interesting that even a lot of uh, colleagues from other countries were immediately saying, oh yes, we recognize that, that's America. Yeah, and, and, um... Uh, Jörg Rosh contributed a, a, a beautiful chapter to this book called My America, mm. in, which he, in which he talks about his early experience of, a, of a, a painting in which this sort of raw vitality of America was represented and how enamored he was of America. And actually it involved a beautiful headdress that an Indian woman chief wore and, and a whole... Uh, 
elaborate fantasy of, of freedom and vitality developed in his mind as a young man or as a boy, which then got um, blown away by Vietnam and, and all sorts of other uh, uh, horrible things that the United States has been involved in. And he ends up by saying that, but America still, his America still exists inside of him. And in fact, maybe it'll be realized in Europe. Um, oh, yes, there you are. <laughs> Here are, can I give you, these are actually three different people saying things that are linked. They're relating yeah. to the cover of the book, which we saw. Jerome Bernstein said, looking at the image of the cover, one can also see it as an image of the possible transition from the destructive shadow of the US cultural complex, wherein with consciousness, our culture can begin to dig it out of the rubble of its shadow of dominance and emerging with a new concept of liberty. And I think parallel to that are two comments, uh, more symbolic comments, one from Susan Rowland, the horse is the hope. He or she is sticking with the human as its only companion. And Betty Sue Flowers said, yes, I like the image of Charlton Heston kneeling before the lady with the lamp. <laughs> So rather a lot of interpretation of dreams. Right? Yeah, yeah. well, that's what a symbol should do. It should evoke all sorts of different meanings that come together. A, a symbol is not a single meaning, and it, it's functioning well as a symbol to draw all these different related and, and uh, uh, comments. And actually, what I would, what I would add to that, is I, I'm going to go to Joe Biden, who, who I know a lot of people think is... Uh, way over the hill and and problematic in many ways but i happen to like joe biden because i actually think he represents a potential umbrella of um uh dignity and and humanity he's a very decent guy i think there's no question about that He's had a long political life, so there, you can point to all sorts of things that are problematic. But fundamentally, he's a very decent guy. And I, I know Bill Bradley, who's a friend of mine, told me Bill was a, ran for president in 2000. And I saw him six or eight months ago. And uh, he was talking about Biden. He said that he liked a lot of the candidates, but he said that, that Biden... I'll, I'll not get it exactly right, but Biden was was the most human. The, uh, Biden was a human being, not just a politician, <laughs> because he has suffered. He has suffered. And we know about his suffering, and there's no question. I mean, he can manipulate or use his suffering for political goals, I guess. And at times when he talks about Bo and the death of his son, it's some, I sometimes wonder what the motivation is, but I have no doubt that Joe Biden has suffered enormously. And perhaps part of a renewed America would be the capacity to suffer. And the result of empathy, maybe. And the result of empathy, that's right. Because most of American history seems to be built on uh, celebrating our, our endless progress mm, success. and conquest and something that might be hopeful in the transformation of our cultural complex would be more humility and the capacity to suffer loss to suffer loss and maintain human dignity uh, and I actually I am hopeful about this in this upcoming election I, I, you know, if you ask me yesterday, maybe I wasn't, and tomorrow I might, maybe I won't be. But I actually think there's a real possibility of something welling up in the in America that could be profoundly renewing in terms of all of the negative complexes that Trump and Trumpism represent. Tricky. Everything is so deeply laid in in our own history, of course. Um, this, what do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, well, it's uh, perhaps it's my own tensions of being an American in the UK at a point where both the US and the UK are just a mess. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, the shame of nations kind of in some ways in both cases. So, yes. Uh, Andrew Samuel, me, yeah. so. Andrew emailed me recently and he, he just said, you know, America's rotten and or 
our government is rotten or whatever. And at first I bridled a little bit, but then I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, he's right. It's mm-hmm. rotten right now. It is rotten. There's just, in fact, <laughs> somebody gave me this hat. Yes. Somebody gave me this hat just yesterday. It's, it's sort of an antidote to the Trump make America great again hat. It says, can you, can you read it or see it? Flush the turd on November 3rd. (laughs) I'm allowed to say that because it's a quote, right? So, (laughs) I mean, you know, we need humor in dark times. You you need to be able to laugh as ugly and as, as, um, as um, deluged with human folly as we are. I mean, we're living in a time of ultimate folly, basically, I think. This is, I have a number of questions in line. Um, I'm thinking of picking picking one that comes from another angle. This is Reham Al-Tahir. And it's contingent on universities, but I think we can open it up further. How can we open up these conversations at universities where students from a variety of cultural complexes feel safe to share and debate some of these characteristics within one another? Is it possible to reach common ground between cultural complexes and create a more integrated cultural complex within the uni atmosphere? I think um, I understand uh, Reham is thinking of universities. I think it can be brought in pretty broadly. Can we discuss each other's complexes without offending? It's a very tricky thing, of course. Well, I, I think the goal of a book like ours is to begin that conversation. And I mean, that's the whole purpose of this book is to, is to lay out, and the other books that I've worked on is to lay out these complexes so that we can become more conscious of them. And of course, what happens, I, I, it almost never fails to happen when you talk about cultural complexes. Inevitably, you step on one. Often it's surprising where it comes from. And the emotional reactivity is so intense that it can blow everybody out of the room. It, I mean, the, the emotions associated with these complexes, uh, whether you're talking about race in the United States or gun control in the United States or the Palestinian Israeli situation, they're so, the affect is so intense that any conversation that you want to um, engage in to, to, to bring people together has to be able to contain the stereotypical ideas, the self-affirming memories, the explosive affect. I think the conversation is possible and maybe a younger generation is already doing it naturally. Maybe younger people are already being exposed to differences that most of us weren't early on in our lives. Maybe, maybe that's already happening, but uh, if this gentleman speaks from the university, maybe he knows that it's not happening. I, I don't know. Well, the difficulty of, as I say, you can see that I'm doing this myself in my life in the UK, and often rather badly. How can I talk about the US and the UK in their country? Right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's something that is never quite smart or quite comfortable. I think that's true. These conversations aren't real if they're not uncomfortable. Yes, yes, that's a hard answer. Um, uh, Let's see, I have a number of possible questions here. Susan Rowland has pointed in a couple of comments towards symbolic and artistic responses as one way through it. I'm wondering if um, I think she's right you know, I work in the arts, but at the same time, I wonder if the arts are big enough for an entire culture. Do you have any any response to that? You do, after all, also uh, co-manage ARAS, the archive of, uh, uh, pardon me, I'm stumbling over the name, the Archive for Research into Archetypal Symbolism, which of course has been sending us extra um, <coughs> symbols and extra images during the lockdown period, which has been pretty wonderful. But is that enough? No, I don't think it's enough, but I think it's a nice start. And I think sharing imagery from different cultures 
at a time of crisis that speaks in one way or another to the distress is a valuable way of communicating. Uh, but I imagine there are so many different ways of, of trying to communicate uh, these these kinds of things that can be creative. Certainly artistic creativity is, is one of the most appealing because uh, it moves us in depth with, often without having to use words. Uh, and so I certainly would affirm that. Um, I don't know how, I, I imagine there are as many ways of moving this conversation along as one can think of. Right now I'm sort of hmm. stuck with art and talking and what else is there? Dance, mm. <laughs> that would be a form of art, of course. Uh, Those would be symbolic representations. Symbolic and I, representations. You know, as someone who spent much of my life in music and the arts, I am aware that uh, there's a large chunk of the world that just does not pay attention. So what would you do then? Or is that the next question? I'm much better at... Um, talking about problems than I am about offering solutions. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And uh, although I am hopeful that what, what Walt Whitman called the barbaric yawp of the American soul, I'm hopeful that things can stir in depth in people in all sorts of ways. And that emergence of a, of a spirit or a soulfulness, which may not know words and it may not know images, but it knows its own essential sort of human spirit in a soulful way. I'm hoping it will emerge in our election, November 3rd, that we're going to see an outpouring of voting. Yeah. might be aware. Yes, yes. <laughs> if, it, is, it is a symbolic choice. It's a symbolic choice. If enough people get moved in depth, mm -hmm. voting is perhaps as good a way as any to bring about a transformation. Thank you. Thank you for doing what you can. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for really a beautiful talk and really wonderful answers to questions. Um, we're going to close now. Thank you all for coming. There were about 80 of us, which was really lovely. Um, in two weeks, we'll be seeing, not quite in two weeks, in two weeks, we'll be seeing Polly Young Eisendrath, except Psychosocial Wednesdays will become a Monday. So just to confuse everyone, we'll announce that on Facebook and in emails to get sent out. And thank you very much, Tom. And I hope, because it's the middle of the day in, uh, Marin County. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you in, uh, this time it will be two weeks short, two days. And please send us any comments or questions on our Facebook page. And um, let me see, what was the other thing I wanted to remember? Perhaps there's not anything. There will be a video that will probably be up within a week of this uh, of this presentation. So thank you everyone and we'll see you in two weeks less two days. Good night.